Hello, my name is Stephen and this is my presentation on the approaches to education research. So, as you're aware, the learning outcome for this presentation is that we're, we're required to demonstrate an in-depth knowledge of research approaches applicable to education and to be able to articulate that knowledge to our audience. I'll do my best to articulate information over the next 15 minutes, although I'm slightly concerned about demonstrating an in-depth knowledge of, of the research approaches in a limited time available, but we'll see how I go on that one. The outline of the presentation will be to firstly define the key terminology associated with education research, then I'll give a visual representation of the context and bigger picture surrounding it, before going on to highlight three key research approaches, followed by a brief conclusion. We shall see that there are many research approaches available to us, and different authors draw our attention to different approaches for different reasons. Cresswell highlights five, while Newby, for example, highlights four, some of which are the same as Cresswell, some of which, for example, action research, are different. I've chosen to study three approaches with the logic to show more than a superficial understanding of them whilst trying to balance the time constraints. Now, we have some key terminology that we need to get our heads around when discussing education research, which I shall briefly address. We'll hear the term worldview, which is a perspective on the world as seen by an individual, whereas a paradigm is a perspective on the world as seen by many, such as a community or a group within society. The common analogy is that of looking through different lenses at the world. There are many factors influencing worldview and paradigms, such as the physical environment, culture, education, religion, politics, and the economic backdrop, amongst others. The research paradigms, also called the research philosophy, are the perspectives or philosophical assumptions surrounding the research. It is the way we think about it. We shall see more on this shortly, but some examples of the research paradigms uh, positivist, critical theories, pragmatism and postmodernist. Each research paradigm has its own ontology, which is the belief, the what is real question. It has its own epistemology, that's where the knowledge comes from, the what is true question, and its own methodology, how do we find out new knowledge and the how do I study it question. It's these research methodologies which is a focus of this presentation. Research methodologies are also called research approaches and research styles, amongst others, depending on where you look. The research approaches give us a justification for using a particular research method. So, whilst trying to get some clarity on the relationship of the various research paradigms with the research approaches, I was pleased to have found the PhD thesis of Katrin Niglas, at least that's how I'm going to say it, uh, from 2001, called The Combined Use of Qualitative and Quantitative Methods in Education Research. It was the happiest I've been since I started this course. She writes that she wanted to produce a diagram to handle and simplify the dizzy multitude of different terms one can find in methodological texts. There's a clear polarity of the positivism and interpretivist paradigms, with the positivism paradigm concerned with more quantitative methods, the need to verify and to be more experimental, whilst the interpretivism paradigm uses qualitative methods, is non-experimental and focuses on understanding and interpretations. However, Niglas highlights that there's a conflict of terminology and the word interpretivist may also mean post-positivist or simply be anything that is non-quantitative. She sees this as an obvious oversimplification to deal with just two research paradigms and even says the six or more she uses in a diagram is still an oversimplification. The diagram Nicholas produced, tries to make sense of the myriad of terms. It isn't the prettiest diagram and it looks like it was done on a typewriter, but it does go some way to making sense of the relationships. 
We can see from the various research paradigms that she calls philosophies uh, in the oval shapes around the outside with the research approaches or methodologies in the rectangular shapes uh, within. Moving left to right we go through a spectrum of quantitative to qualitative research approaches. We will return to this diagram at the end. So, moving on to our specific research approaches, I've chosen to look at the case study approach, grounded theory approach and the ethnographic approach. We were encouraged to consider a diversity of approaches which are perhaps unfamiliar and since I come from a primarily science background, pretty much all of the qualitative research approaches were unfamiliar to me. The case study approach Newby states that the purpose of the case study approach is to bring attention to critical incidents, to innovative practice or to present exemplars whether good or bad. Stenhouse highlights how in an educational research setting the researcher is likely to be familiar with their environment which is a key difference to the ethnographic approach as we'll see later. Yin proposes three forms of case study which are exploratory looking for patterns in data, descriptive, considering theories and research questions, and explanatory, to explain what is being studied. Hamilton and Corbett Whittier note that there is still academic debate as to whether the case study approach is indeed an approach, or a genre, or a strategy, or a method, or otherwise. In the case study approach, the researcher plays the role of an external analyst. Swanborn says this approach is especially useful when intensive, holistic and in-depth investigation is required and Bromley argues that case studies are the bedrock of scientific investigation on the basis that one-off events captured in case studies can then initiate further research. To save reading out numerous surnames, other key authors can be seen on the screen. Some of the key data gathering methods that the case study approach lends itself to are interviews which can be done over a sustained period of time, naturalistic observations or participant observation. The strengths of this approach are that it's good for relatability rather than generalizability and as Kulikan says it can provide rich data giving us insight such as the impact of unemployment on a family. It may reveal findings that a larger scale study may hide. It may capture isolated events which may disprove widely held theories. And the data that is provided is grounded in lived reality. Amongst its many limitations are that it could be open to interpretation. It may be difficult to give generalizations. And Bell and Waters suggest that analyzing single events may distort overall findings. There are questions around reliability the replicability and the cost of large-scale studies. There may be subjective selection of the subject matter and there may be observer interaction and Newby argues that detailing the truth can be difficult. The Grounded Theory Approach This was developed by Barney Glaser and Anselm Strauss in 1967 for their work studying people dying in hospital. Nice. It's an inductive approach, meaning that the findings should reveal themselves from the data. It offers systematic, flexible data collection, and the name grounded theory obviously means that it's grounded in the real world. It offers research into human interactions and may be used to investigate questions such as what happens in conflicts between students and teachers, or what hinders learning in the classroom. The idea is to generate theory from empirical data which can later be tested through research. It seeks to produce a statement or conclusion that can be applicable or tested in similar circumstances. One important concept is that of the cyclical nature of data collection and analysis, starting with theoretical sampling. The findings in turn generate a new theory to study. The coding of the data is refined as the process develops. The belief that it's based on is that meaning is created through interaction between people and our understanding of meaning and meaningfulness affects the way we act. 
There have been several variations and extensions on the original grounded theory by Glaser and Strauss, by authors such as Corbin and Strauss, Glaser on his own, Bryant, Sharmaz and Clark. Data is collected in a variety of ways, such as interviews, transcripts of meetings, court proceedings, field observations and questionnaires. The methods should produce unstructured data, such as text or images, and the purpose is to generate theories not to test them, so interviews should be unscripted and questionnaires should use open questions. The strength of the grounded theory approach includes its adaptability, that it's suited to small-scale research, that its explanations are grounded in reality, and that it encourages theoretical development and testing. On the other hand, it has been criticised because it may be difficult to avoid leading questions, it may be difficult to plan for due to the cyclical nature of data collection and theorising, and it can become complex as it develops. Yin said that one of the four principles of good research should be that the researcher uses the expert knowledge, the prior knowledge in analysing the data, although this idea may conflict with the grounded theory approach. It can also be seen as empiricist, meaning that relying too heavily on fieldwork data, it implies there must be an explanation in the data collected, even though this may, uh, this may be a very limited amount. Generalisations about the whole population may be made, whereas the data can really only provide theories about that uh, the data that is collected. The ethnographic approach the word ethnographic comes from the Greek word ethno, meaning people, and graphic, meaning writing, i.e. it involves writing about people. Brewer describes it as the study of people in their natural environment, not the natural environment. It doesn't seek to change behaviour, but to observe it. Ethnography can be attributed to Russian Gerhard Friedrich Muller, who used it on a history and geography expedition in the early 18th century, and anthropologist Bronislaw Malinowski utilised it in his work studying daily life in other communities. It's believed that the researcher is a participant in what is being observed, whether they are visible or hidden. The emphasis is on investigating social phenomena, rather than focusing on proving or disproving hypotheses. Again, the key writers are noted, noted on screen. Data can be gathered through a variety of methods such as conversation, observing and recording, documents and artefacts, interviews, and for want of a better expression, the informants. Strengths of the ethnographic approach lie in its adaptability and for giving first-hand observations. The researcher may be present for extended periods of time, producing in-depth data. The approach can be flexible and discreet, and can be a valuable tool in highlighting the differences in what subjects say and what they do. The limitations include that it's open to interpretation, and there occasionally may be limited time spent observing, in which case the data collected may be superficial. Newby suggests that there may be ethical implications if the researcher is undercover or seen as an insider. The presence of the researcher could unwittingly influence the given scenario, or they may become empathetic to the subjects. It's difficult to make generalisations with this approach, although this should be a consideration prior to starting any research. So, I've now presented different research approaches, and as promised, we shall return to the diagram from Niglas, which I've now highlighted where the four approaches lie that I have discussed. It's evident from my presentation and from this visualisation that whilst there are clear differences between them, there's also a degree of overlap and scope for mixing the various approaches. I've highlighted that there are several research paradigms and even more research approaches. Much to the frustration of this master's student, there remains inconsistency and debate over the terminology and there is overlap between their paradigms and approaches within them. Furthermore, these approaches can be mixed. There are of course strengths and weaknesses of all the research approaches, but the light at the end of the tunnel 
is that there are various frameworks to help the researcher to decide which research approach is best suited for their education research. Thanks for listening.